Welcome to Live from Plato's Cave. I am Mario Vega. This is episode 24, Extinction Rebellion with Hannah Prince. One of the things I like to do in my free time is to compare the first and the last scene from Plato's Allegory of the Cave. In the first scene, the prisoners are stuck in the cave and they are forced to watch shadows on a wall. And in the last scene, the released prisoner returns from the journey to the surface back into the cave. We can ask ourselves, what are the chains made of and what do they stand for? In the allegory, they are that which prevent the people in the cave from moving. So they are stuck in one perspective, they cannot move their head or their entire body. And because they don't know they're stuck, they experience that perspective as the truth rather than a perspective. There is a social psychology experiment called the smoke-filled room study. In this experiment, the participant is under the impression that she is in the waiting room, waiting to be called in to the room where the actual experiment will take place. She is waiting together with other people who are in fact in on the experiment because this experiment is already taking place. Now, some smoke comes into the room from under a door and an alarm goes off. But the people in that room, so the ones that are in on the experiment, they have been instructed to remain calm and not do anything. Pretend nothing is happening. So what do you think she does? Does she get up to check out where the smoke comes from? No, she doesn't even get up. She waits patiently until she's called in for the so-called actual experiment. You can watch the video in the description and you see the room is filling with smoke and everybody is just sitting there. So if this were a real fire, she and the other people in that room would be in a lot of trouble. Yeah, what if the fire in Plato's cave that projects the shadows on the wall would actually emit this toxic smoke? What if the chains that keep the prisoners in place are actually social and psychological? Now, let's go to the second scene, so the last scene of Plato's Allegory of the Cave. The former prisoner has realized something. They were able to breathe the clean air of the surface. But when they return into the cave, they are unable to shake the people up that remained there all the time. Plato writes how this person, and of course he's referring to Socrates, how this person is forced to defend himself in court. And he has to justify why he is warning people about the smoke that is filling the room, why he's taking such extreme actions. Yeah, perhaps Socrates was an activist, and perhaps he was engaging in civil disobedience. Our guide today is Hannah Prince. Hannah is a climate activist and studies criminal law and international law in Amsterdam. She is active in the Extinction Rebellion legal circle and is passionate about protecting the right to demonstration. Hannah read an IPCC report when she was 16 years old and couldn't understand why the politicians and companies in her country are fully aware of the catastrophic path that we're on and that we're not yet acting on the science. I personally find it absurd that in our society People who glue themselves to museum walls, talk show tables and private jets, that those are the people that are on the side of science and the people who actually have the power to change things and prevent the most catastrophic effects of climate change, think those people are radical. Hello. Thank you so much for speaking with me at your university. Yes, thank you for the invitation. Uh, you just had a class, right? Well, it actually got cancelled. So I came from home. But yeah, I do study here at the FU University. Mm-hmm. And uh, what will you be when you graduate? Um, not a lawyer yet, but I might become a criminal lawyer. Okay. Yeah, because I'm studying criminal law and international law. And why do you want to be a criminal lawyer? Um, well, because I want to keep activists out of jail and I want to put the... CEOs of polluting companies in jail. So then what do you need? Criminal law. I told you before, I'm interested in many different areas of science and academics, but this is something I don't know anything about. So Well, I, I also <laughs> don't know that much yet. Eh? Well, probably more than me. <laughs> yeah, so 
I saw you, I think, for the first time on a talk show in the Netherlands after someone uh, glued yeah. themselves to a painting. Yeah, and then someone glued themselves to a talk show table. Oh, yeah. That and then was the it. next day, yeah. I was sitting there together with the guy who glued himself to the talk show table. All right. Without glue this time. So why did they invite you? Um, that's a really good question. No, because we were there to talk about the climate crisis and about... Do, is it like an effective way to glue your, you know, is it effective to glue yourself to a painting or to glue yourself to a talk show table? Mm -hmm. And we thought it is. And why? Well, because it's just whatever gets attention. And now gluing yourself to a painting might not generate the amount of attention anymore. So we've already moved on. But a month ago, gluing yourself to a painting was a very effective way to come on TV and to be able to send out your message. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking too that, um, yeah, if people still do it now, uh, it might actually kind of destroy some of the message of before. Yeah, so it's time to start doing like new actions. Yeah. So that's what we're planning. And there was also a great action during a concert. Yes. Yeah. During a boomer concert. No, just kidding. <laughs> In the concertgebouw during mm -hmm. classical concert, during the break, someone stood up to give a speech of a minute. So I didn't even want to like and the music, and he was harassed by all the old people who wanted mm. to listen to the music. And were you involved in that? In no, 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 I didn't help organize that action. No. The idea of XR is everybody who joins can organize their own actions if they're in line with the principles of XR. So people organize like hundreds of actions a year and, you know, you can just do it out of yourself. You don't have to ask for, for, for permission or anything. So XR is Extinction Rebellion? And um, what's your role there? Yeah, so Extinction Rebellion is a movement that started in 2018 in the UK. And it actually quickly spread across the world. I think we're in like over half the countries of the world now. And what we do is we use, in Dutch we call it burgerlijke ongehoorzaamheid, but civil disobedience mm -hmm. to bring our point across. And it's a very effective way of uh, action. And it's been used in the U.S. for civil rights. It's been used here to get women to vote. It's been used to get weekends. It's been used to get eight-hour workdays. So it's a very effective way to bring about change. And I joined two and a half years ago because I walked past a big XR uh, demonstration. And I thought, this is really nice. And then I just emailed them, hello, I'm studying law. Can I be in the legal circle? Mm -hmm. And then I was in the legal circle. So civil disobedience is like uh, Rosa Parks sitting in the bus when the law is, you cannot do that. Yeah, or, so it's like yeah. you break a small law mm -hmm. to make a bigger point. Yeah. So usually you're not allowed to sit on a road, but we break that law in order to make our point. Yeah, so you're aware that there's a law? Yeah, yeah, people, of course, people know that. If, if you ever get in front of a judge, you cannot say, well, I didn't know uh, the law. Because no, you're but... Even civil disobedience falls under your right of demonstration. So yeah. we're allowed to be there. Your right of demonstration is more important than people being able to pass through that specific street. Yeah. All right. And so you were you were invited on a talk show. It's the first time I saw a, a climate activist. Uh, the second time, actually, because the day before someone glued themselves to the table. Yeah. Um, in that talk show, the, the talk show host also said, well, yeah, actually climate is a big problem. Uh, my, my children also uh, tell me, but uh, now I start Things to realize. Things are changing, eh? If yeah, talk show hosts I mean, are saying that. We should pay more attention to it. So that was nice because there were some uh, scientists on the table and some... Um, uh, activists. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, things are really changing. Yeah. Because I think I got called off from talk shows maybe like 20 times or something. And now I've been there twice in the past month. So you really see that the attention is growing and that we're actually getting a place to tell our story there. And what do you mean by called off? Yeah, so they ask, they call you to ask you if you want to be on the talk show, but then they cancel you again, like the day before or the day itself, because there's more important news. But of course, there's no more important news than the climate crisis. And what were some of the things that you were, was more important than your item? Sometimes you don't even know, but sometimes there are like other important things that happen the day of, yeah. but... Um, yeah, sometimes you also just don't know what the reason is, you know, and then you're 
you see on the news like I don't know some local singer did has a new album and you're like no we need to discuss the climate crisis every day on every TV show but I also understand that sometimes you need some lighter things yeah, yeah it's a strange um, world eh, of the of the talk shows because yeah. you you are there so you are invited there but do you feel you can really get your message across when you sit there well it's always hard you need to like take your space and just tell your story and with some presenters it's a bit harder than with others but already being there is like a big step forward and we also we shouldn't like make talk shows the most important thing like if you've been in a talk show it doesn't mean the entire world is going to change so we also need to like see that yeah it's great that we're in talk shows but we also need to be in every newspaper it you know the government also needs to start doing like a climate press conference every week mm -hmm. to tell us about what's happening so it's not just talk shows but it's a really nice way to sort of see how it's going with the movement yeah have you ever been arrested yes like eight <laughs> you're times saying, <laughs> you're saying say that like you're proudly you say proudly um, yeah so eight you're times, I yeah think. so you're a student of the law consciously breaking the law and getting arrested yeah because we're right i think you're allowed to break the law if you have a, a point that's right to bring across yeah um, so yeah, I've been arrested, I think, eight times. And it's not like a fun, ex you know, I'm saying like, yes, I've been arrested, but it's not like a super fun experience. I would also be rather doing something else, but we feel this is so important. So we put like literally our bodies on the line to bring our point across. Yeah. So can you maybe just take us through one, uh, one action where, how does it work? You prepare for it, which is your, you know, the one you are most proud of? Um... Well, the one I'm most proud of is maybe the one at Schiphol. Oh yeah, that was But recently. I wasn't arrested at that one, no. but I can tell that. And then another time when I was arrested. So the one at Schiphol with 600 activists, we blocked private jets for the entire day so they couldn't leave. Yeah. Um, yeah, preparation starts months before. This action was Extinction Rebellion together with Greenpeace. So there's talks of where it will be. We have talks with lawyers to check, you know, what we should do, what we shouldn't do. Um, what the consequences will be, then we need to rally everybody to come, you know, you don't get 600 people in a place just like that. Then we need to train everybody, so we give legal training so people know how long the police can keep them, what to do if the police uses violence, who you can call from the police station, stuff like that. And then it's the day of. And all the groups also don't really know of each other what is happening, what is going on. And then suddenly, there's like groups of hundreds of people coming from all these corners, and then we just went through the gates and over the gates, and then we were there. So the the groups don't. Uh, so they're like cells. They yeah, like they, we call them yeah. fingers. So yeah. you have multiple fingers, and for like safety reasons, because the police sometimes infiltrate. Uh, it's good that not every group knows exactly what is going on where, mm -hmm. but we do all know what like the main goal is and where we're going to be. Yeah. And then suddenly there were like groups of hundreds of people coming from all these corners. And then they all went over or through the gates. And then we were there at the private jets. So that was really nice. And I was negotiating with the Mare Chaussée. I don't know what the English word is. Like the border police. Border police, yeah. Um, which was also like an intense, you know, thing to do. Mm -hmm. When are you 25 and negotiating with the border police about important things? Um, yeah, and they, they're trained to negotiate with terrorists yeah. and criminals and everything. <laughs> yeah, so it's also nice for them to negotiate with, with nice people for yeah. once. Um, and how yeah. are those, are those like just civil conversations? Yeah, of or? course, of course, of course. Especially here, they're like, they understand why we're there, you know, yeah. we're not there for ourselves or to break down planes or whatever. We were really there to make like a political point. Um, so that was a really nice action. And then another action was the big action before that on the A12, the highway. Well, it's actually not officially a highway. Between the between Parliament and the Ministry of Economics and Climate, yeah. which is not really climate. Um, and we had like an action there with 100 people. And then we all got arrested and we had to wait in the police bus for a while. And then you go to the police station and then you wait there for a few hours. Mm -hmm. And then you talk to the... So during the action, do, did you glue yourself to something? No, because or? I was police contact. So ah, I'm in okay. contact with the police yeah. all the time. 
So if there's a, so you're there with the group, police yeah. usually knows that you're coming. Yeah, the um, police are there before yeah. we are there. So they're coming and they're looking, are they asking for who is the contact? Or? Yeah, yeah, or I just walk up to them and say, hi, today I'm the police contact. And that's, you know, usually also... Um, so there's kind of an understanding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they like the understanding is really growing because we're always peaceful. Yeah. Um, so they really know these people are never going to hurt us. There is still some police violence, of course, but it's it looks like it's slowing down a bit after a few years. Yeah. So that's nice. And we're speaking in the Netherlands. Yes. And you're white. Yes. Um, yeah. So that's also a thing. So like, you can you can do this without yeah, yeah. fearing of your yeah. life, which yeah. in many countries. Yeah. And also, in the, you know, like XR st- is still a pretty white movement, and we need to get more diverse. And, but one of the reasons why it's so hard is, as a white person. I grew up with the idea, if something goes wrong, you can call the police and maybe you will get like a ticket for being on your phone while biking. And that's it. That's what the police is in your life. But for people of color, also in the Netherlands, they have a totally different relationship with the police and putting yourself on the line to voluntarily get in contact with them and get arrested. It's, you know, it's not the same. And people of color are usually treated extra harshly. So we really try to prepare people for that, train them, train the people around the people of color, you know, take extra measures, make sure you film everything. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, unfortunate. Yeah. Yeah. But that is the current situation we're in. And we also have the situation with the police handling climate protesters way more harsh than maybe other groups in society like the angry farmers or the blackface wearing people. Yeah, we just had, uh, was it yesterday or the day before, some observers from Amnesty International yeah. were attacked and ambushed with fireworks. Uh, Their bags were, st- it's unbelievable. Yeah. By people in, in blackface. <laughs> yeah, like how is this possible in a functioning democracy? Because Amnesty, so they also come a lot to our protests as observers and they film everything, you know, and they are there to really observe if our rights to protest is being guaranteed. Mm -hmm. And that stuff like this happens is unbelievable. But that's, you know, that's the Netherlands. The right to protest is really under a big threat. Yeah, that's been said as well by, I think, was the UN or was it Amnesty that um, there was a report about this, a warning about the uh, right to protest yeah. in the Netherlands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I also went last November to Geneva to talk about this at the UN. Yeah. And there were people from all over Europe and everybody was at the first meeting was like, no, 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 no. But you in Holland, why are you even here? You should be fine. And then I was like, let me tell you some things. And after the first meeting, everybody was like, okay. Okay, that really doesn't sound okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's like basic human rights that are not being taken care of. So when there's an action like that that, and you're there and and there's like all this stuff going on and a lot of drama, right? Are you ever able to kind of have a helicopter view? Yeah, I think so. Because in stress situations, I feel really calm. Yeah. So... It's also sort of nice to be like, we need to go there quickly. We need to discuss this. I feel really calm when we're there, but always beforehand, I have like a bit of like anxiety. I'm like, oh, will it all work? Will everybody be okay? But once we're in our place, using our right to demonstrate, then I go sort of into work mode and it's like negotiating, getting everything fixed, making sure everybody's in the right place. And then I also have the helicopter view where I'm like seeing everything that's happening and like taking notes and stuff. And what do you think then? Because it's qu- it's quite an absurd situation with people sitting on a highway and there's police, but you're, I mean, they, they're just doing their job as well. They're yeah. real people too. And yeah. Yeah. There's, they're talking to a tw- 25 year old woman. And yeah, so wh- what, what do you make of that? Yeah. So I'm, I've gotten sort of used to it, but when new people join, they're like, whoa, you know, because it's, it looks really unstructured sometimes, but it's extremely structured and extremely thought out. Everybody is super well prepared. And yeah, it's just, it's, it's really special to be in a protest because you're with all these people who like have like an inner fire for the same thing. And it just gives the most special atmosphere if you're at a protest together and if you're like working towards something good. So it's always really, yeah, it's like a really, really special experience to be in a demonstration. Mm-hmm. And 
discussing with the police. Yeah, I think they're also, you know, some of them know me by now. I think they're used to me being, yo- you know, being young and discussing with them. Yeah, just, you know, I know my things. They know, some of them know their things. So it's always a good, you know, we can work together pretty well. Yeah, so then there's an, the next one is uh, soon. 26th of November. Yeah. So yeah. you probably meet maybe some police from before. Yeah, and they called me already and, you know, we discussed some things. Uh, yeah, and it's usually the same people who come. Yeah. And by now they also know that we're so extremely peaceful, so they're a bit more chill, which is yeah. Just really nice. Yeah. I really appreciate speaking with you because I'm just trying to make sense of the situation we're in. And um, we're speaking like nicely now, but you're not you're doing this for a reason yes and maybe maybe you can tell me later like how how do you deal with the with the anger of what's going on organizing are, actions are you angry yeah super yeah. angry okay let's let's okay, okay. <laughs> let's focus on this first okay because just to get to know you a little bit because um there's uh, when i speak about you i speak about the activists there's a certain image of the activists And I've been watching how this image is reacted to and constructed. So you're you're there. You want you want to send a certain message, but uh, for instance, the first uh, not this was not you, but the first time some tomato soup was thrown at the uh, Van Gogh painting. This was an interesting moment for me because I've been interested in climate, but I also got a museum card since yeah. a few months, and there was no tomato soup on the painting it was on the glass plate yes but for for me personally it was interesting because i never really been into art but i really start started to uh go to the van gogh museum for the first time in 20 years and everything like that just the, the weeks before and then I, i heard these two things come together and usually in this podcast i focus on things you know more philosophical or, or something like that But I felt I I have to do something with that. I have to make sense of this in some way. Because so what I was talking about was the, the message. So their message for me was instantly clear because they said, well, uh, you're uh, I wish something like I wish you were protecting the world in the same way that you were protecting this painting. So then I think, well, they know that the painting is protected. Because otherwise that wouldn't yeah, make sense. Yeah, of course sense. they knew. They, uh, nobody has thrown, like nothing got damaged anywhere. But that message got lost. So in the first immediate, the first action, at least that was my, my perception mm-hmm. of it, that many people didn't get it. And they were talking about destroying art. So there's the message you want to send. Like, okay, I'm throwing for them, in their experience, they're throwing soup at glass. Uh, in the experience of many other people, they are throwing soup at a painting. And uh, where was I going with this? Yeah, the, so you're you're trying you're trying to get a message into the world, right? You're um, trying to stir people yeah. up. The thing is, uh, scientific research has shown that this is very effective, and it's it's also okay if there's some more extreme actions because that changes the v- like if you feel throwing soup on a glass thing in front of a painting yeah. is extreme maybe you find now sitting on a road not extreme anymore mm-hmm. so it it like shifts the entire way of people thinking and it also i think made really a lot of people think like why do i get so mad at soup on a painting and why don't i get mad at i don't know like shell destroying half of nigeria with their leaking yeah. oil so people were also thinking like oh why is my anger hit towards this one specific thing yeah so you you do something you get a reaction but then you're trying to kind of uh, bend the reaction towards what, yeah so when you i think when you were in the talk show it was also a little bit like that because people were there was about the the the, the man who stuck himself to the table mm-hmm. it was a lot about is this the right message and uh, if you're trying to convince people why would you ch- it's a lot about the Doesn't matter. it, it yeah. matters if it works and so it that, works and then you were saying as well like yeah but you know this we're talking about this again instead of what it's really about yeah and it the you know the time for big philosophical arguments is maybe done it just works We're at a talk show table. It's getting attention. It's in every newspaper. You know, even if people get angry about it, that's okay. We're also not there to make friends or to be found super 
sympathetic, if that's the English word. We're not there for that. We're there to get a message across. And that just worked. And the movement has grown like hugely in the last few weeks. Yeah. And the uh, soup on glass plates has definitely helped towards that. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to agree with it now, but maybe you'll agree with it two years, you know, in two years. Yeah. And you can say, yeah, it's good that you're doing this, but do it towards like the private jets, for instance. Mm -hmm. That one got a lot of attention, but XR has been blocking uh, a coal train here in Amsterdam for months already, every week. Yeah. They stop a coal train for a few hours until they get arrested. That almost gets no coverage. So it's also like whatever works, whatever yeah, so it takes. People were asking, journalists were asking, the activists. It was all a lot about, yeah, this is not the way, this is not the way. Yeah. Um But then they didn't, didn't come up with, okay, what is the way? And and then they said, but why don't you go stick yourself to the building of Shell? We answer, did that already. We did. We've been doing yeah. this for, for, for years, years. And, and not getting it. So attention. every yeah. way is the way as long as it's peaceful. Yeah. You know, I mean, we're all going to die from the climate crisis. That's sort of a fact by now. So we need to do everything to try to make the worst effects a bit less worse. Yeah. And that also includes throwing soup on a painting. I mean, no art on a dead planet, right? Yeah. So I'm noticing I want to avoid it because this is the thing. No, like, no, what tell is, me. What is at the... No, uh, I mean more the emotion of it, oh, yeah, right? Yeah. So when you say something like that, yeah. like we're all going to die from the climate crisis. Yeah. When did you become aware of the state of the planet so yeah. to speak <laughs> at what age so like? i think i was already raised from a young age you know speak up if something's wrong yeah. be brave stuff like that pippi Lankaus. so pippi, pippi longstocking long yeah. was like my my mom always tried to make her my sort of person to look up to when i was really small you know so be brave speak up and then i slowly got into climate things so i joined like a green left party i went to a climate march i Joined the Jonge what, Klimaat what Beweging. Uh, 16, 17, something like that. I was already into feminism. When I was even younger, we blocked a place in my neighborhood where there were some trees that they wanted to cut down. And we were able to delay the process for a few years. Um, and, you know, but I saw it's not working. If you do another petition, if you vote for a Green Left Party, it's really not helping. And then I think I read one of the IPCC uh, things that came out, the condensed version, not the entire report, of course. And then I thought, whoa, we're really fucked. And I hadn't heard that in the media. I hadn't heard that anywhere. But this was, so how did you think about it before? First I thought, yeah, okay, the climate is changing. It might get a bit hotter here. Haha, <laughs> we might have like... Some droughts, but we should be fine. Like that, that, that's how I grew up as well, saying, well, there, you know, I was also really concerned with nature and also for my parents. Yeah. We didn't have a car by yeah. choice and, and everything. Like, oh, the polar bears might die. You yeah, know? exactly. That's what and I they're, thought they're cutting the down trees. Was. Uh, they're, cut, they're yeah. cutting down trees. And uh, in many, of course, uh, third world nations uh, at the time, uh, things were going bad and and of course a love for nature and everything like that yeah but this is still like nature as part of your world but i have the feeling with you that it's had be, has become your entire at least the theme of uh, your of my life. life yeah <laughs> well i don't know if it's i mean you know you're you like an activist, but you're also later. you're also a friend yeah. and i also make a podcast you know you're many you know i'm an, and i'm a daughter and i'm a sister so you also have many other rules but yeah i, I don't know since i got clear what crisis we're in it's more radical to not take action than to take action so then i thought okay we really need to do something and then i joined xr and i met like like-minded people who also read the ipcc reports listened to the scientists and were like holy shit can i swear on this podcast sure go yeah, ahead okay. <laughs> Share, yeah. swear what you want and then the only thing you can do is like yeah then it, of course it consumes your life and you're like yeah We're all going to die. We have to do something now. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but I, I have a PhD in discursive psychology. So I'm studying like how do people speak and what, yeah, how do conversations go basically. Yeah. And one of the things that I'm missing in many conversations about climate is repeating just climate 101. So like stating the basics. So stating, stating the basics. 
Okay, so I'm asking you. So, okay, what what is going on? What is going just on? Just in okay. like a, a minute, or just yeah. take a, just a yeah. few minutes or something. What is going on with yeah, the world? Yeah, that's actually a good question that many people don't ask. So the thing is, since the pre-industrial time, the climate has warmed 1.2 to 1.3 degrees, and right now that already means droughts, huge wildfires floods, uh, lots of crop yields going down, crops, yeah, not working, um, water shortages, stuff like that. And that's already happening now at 1.2, 1.3 degrees. So this 1.3 degrees is how much the... Uh, climate has climate warmed, warmed since in, pre-industrial which level. Which so is like, like 1600? No, 1800. since 1800. Since and, uh, Van Gogh uh, yeah, lived. Yeah. yeah, and like 80% of the CO2 has been emitted in the last 50 years. Mm -hmm. And it's only going up exponentially. And the thing is, humans are perfect for the world and we can really thrive here because it's such a stable climate and it was for the past i don't know 20,000 years you know it was like a bit colder in winter a bit nicer in summer it was perfect to grow food we had lots of you know it was a great temperature to live in and now because of human interference the climate is warming up so fast that it's irregulating all the systems that's surrounding the earth so we need like a stable earth to be able to live and the stability is totally gone. So that's a climate crisis. Then we also have like the ecological crisis, which means that we're in the sixth mass extinction. There's tens of animals a day that are going extinct yeah. and we need those literally to survive. Yeah, so going extinct is normal to some extent because yeah. there's like a, a certain rate at which new animals come there and, and go extinct. But... The one we're witnessing now is like is, a mass extinction. Yeah, like so it's like the same as around like the dinosaur stuff like that. Yeah. It's unbelievable what's happening. Like when my parents were younger, when they would go on vacation, the car would be filled with bugs. Mm -hmm. If you drive, would drive for a few hours. Where are all the bugs? Yeah. I, I haven't seen them, you know. Even in my childhood, we had to clean the car sometimes. Now, well, okay, we don't have a car. But now, in theory, if you drive for days, there's almost no bugs. Yeah. So that's what's happening. And what is going to come is half of the world is going to be underwater and half of the world is going to be on fire. That's sort of the really short answer. Huge parts of the world are already uninhabitable because it's just too hot for humans to live in like 60 degrees Celsius. We just can't survive that. We can't grow our food there. Yeah, we literally can't survive that. And that is going to grow even more the areas that are going to be unlivable. All those people have to migrate to areas where temperatures might be okay. But, you know, is there place enough? Can You know, who's going to take care of it? And another big thing is that already, uh, like, crops are failing at a huge state. There's around the world, like, a sort of wave of farmers committing suicide because their crops just keep and keep and keep on failing. So that's also what's going to happen. There's going to be sh huge food shortages. The UN already expects this to happen next year. All of this has the effect on politics and on like hu unrest. Yeah. And so the predictions are that also here societies are going to collapse within the next 10 to 20 years. Like totally sort of collapse. Mm -hmm. So that's what's coming. Oh yeah, and we're going to be totally underwater. But that's, <laughs> yeah, that's also <laughs> going to happen. Us in the Netherlands. Yeah, like because... That. Our like so delta, like our water works, yeah. can take forty centimeters, and we are definitely already going to experience two meters of water in twenty one hundred. Definitely, that's already even if we would do everything that we could right now, that the water is coming. Yeah. So someone who's born now will likely, you know, the weird life expectancy is growing. Yeah. So someone who's born now, or like, uh, well, I have five year old daughter. By her 80s or 90s, that will be that will likely be. Yeah, there won't. Yeah, but the, also the um, prediction is that life expectancy is go it's already going down in some countries, mm -hmm. and that it will go down even more because yeah, it's really hard to survive. Even here in Holland, with heat waves, like every heat wave, 800 extra people die, and heat waves will become more, longer and hotter, and 
Europe, you know, we've been able to close our eyes and we have closed our eyes from what's happening in the rest of the world. But especially Europe is going to be extremely, uh, like, it will have extremer temperatures. The closer you get to the poles, the more the extremes will be there. So Europe is going to be also become almost unlivable in summer because of the storms that are happening, because of, you know, you can't grow crops anymore. Yeah. Yeah, so that's all what's definitely going to come. Yeah, and and uh, the summary is also that there's going to be a lot of instability. So yeah. things change and our uh, societies are not... Built. Literally not built for what is coming. Yeah, we're not prepared for it. Yeah. And we also sort of can't totally see what exactly is going to come. Yeah. yeah. So what you're saying is not it's not nothing controversial. No, uh, this I mean, is like the, you know... There's scientific consensus on this. This is not a crazy thing. This yeah. is just hard facts. And the thing is, like, the IPCC report is still a conservative bet. Because sometimes if things are too extreme, they don't put it in. That's sort of the really short version. Yeah. If they can't really predict it, they won't put it in the IPCC report. So the IPCC report is a very conservative idea of what is going to happen. Yeah. And that already says we're on our way to climate hell. This is going to be the end of humanity if we don't do something right now. Yeah. Yeah. And just to make sure, because consensus is used a lot uh, as well in different contexts, but it's consensus in the same way that there's consensus that smoking causes cancer. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing in, in science is ever 100% sure, but I saw a study about more than 99% uh, of at least the experts. Yeah. Of the scientists. <laughs> uh, yeah. Of the scientists. They and say the other is, yeah. 0.01% or whatever it is, are paid by Shell and whatever to do research. So yeah, it's and also you can see it, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's autumn, but it felt like spring. Yeah. And the Elfstede tocht we have in Holland, so where you would go ice skating between 11 cities, the last time it happened was in the year I was born. Yeah. And it you know, it used to happen year in year out. And then yeah. people say the climate always changes. Yeah, it does, but not like this. Mm -hmm. This is really because of what humans actually the west actually the oil companies and the governments have done yeah and how does that make you feel yeah so angry and the thing that does give hope is actions because you know you can sort of give up and just lie in your bed all day but that's also not going to do anything right mm -hmm. but yeah like in my legal circle so we're with like 10 young some lawyers some not lawyers nobody wants children yeah everybody's like yeah i'm just not going to do this I'm not going to do it. You know, they want children, but we're all like, mm -mm, we're not going to put children on this world. It's just too much for them. We can't do it to them. Yeah. Yeah. And how do you look at um, the people who were like, had their working life in, in the 80s and the 90s? So the the well, I think one of the first IPCC reports came out in the 90s, I think. <laughs> So if people were like in their 20s and 30s by that time, they had their career and everything, they were in positions of power in politics and everything. And, and before that, you could say, okay, time at science is, yeah, maybe not 100% certain. Yeah, but, but also already like... Also, but also after not... After 19, after the 70s, it was really already sort of certain. But yeah. the oil and gas companies are just, and like big meat are just, they have such strong lobby. It's unbelievable. Like even at the last COP, so the last climate conference, there were more than 636 people from the oil and gas companies, mm -hmm. just as lobbyists. Eh? There were way more. Yeah. But like if you want to stop smoking, you also don't ask Moboro to join a meeting. Wow. Why are they, they, there was, there's no reason for them to be there. Did you read uh, Merchants of Doubt? Yeah. Or did you see the documentary? Yeah. Oh, you should see it. It's about... So the the it's the about people whose job it is to be a merchant of doubt, and they uh, worked for the tobacco lobby, um, weapons lobby, and everything. And they uh, in the documentary you can see them explaining their their job. It's not a conspiracy theory yeah. or something. Those are people that are get paid, and their job was to delay. Yeah, uh, action. same with the oil. Yeah, yeah, by um, uh, spreading doubt, so they don't say well. Uh, we're, we don't agree that smoking causes cancer, but they say, well, but this we, need more we need more research. evidence, we need yeah. more research. Um, there will be technology that, yeah. that can fix it. So, so that's horrible. And also like yeah. the advertising mm -hmm. that has been done. Many people think that Shell is actually doing great. Less than 5% of their 
annual income goes yeah. to clean things and the thing that goes to clean the money that goes to clean things is usually subsidized money but yeah it's um, it's unbelievable what they have done and also you can see if they want to get a big project pushed they do way more lobbying way more advertisements so people really believe that shell is actually changing they're really not they got sued over it and they you know and they still want to start pumping for oil and gas in 700 new places around the world yeah. including our north sea yeah yes yeah, so i want to i want to speak about the the legal side but first a little bit more because the situation how we talk about it you can explain it you can explain why it is like you can explain you know the merchants of doubt or lobbyists or people how the media works and so like, for instance the war in ukraine is still going on but people just get tired of that and yeah. and then you know it it's just a way of how our society works but if you if we go back to the, the just the climate 101 how do you explain it that because this is this is what the scientists say it's just like a scientist or a doctor tells you while well, you're smoking you have beginning stages of lung cancer we can maybe treat it it will be a diff- little bit difficult but maybe it's a good idea to stop smoking uh, and we can think of all the reasons you know all the forces that are at work and so but how uh yeah i don't I'm trying to get to this question, you know, because it's really a question that really concerns me. Yeah, so why it hasn't been communicated, why people don't know what is going on and what is going to happen. Well, people know what's going on, so it would be another thing. Yeah, but also not, you know, many people think, oh yeah, climate change, but not climate crisis, you know. Yeah, but there's always... We have lots of politicians who don't even believe in climate change, so all the people that follow them... But that means they don't, they're science deniers. They don't believe yeah, in science. Yeah, but they are, well, yeah. yeah, they say other crazy things. So, yeah, yeah. they're also science deniers. Um, it's just to make it really simple. I, you know, I was reminded, reminded yesterday of this experiment of the smoke filled room study. Do you know it? No. So, it's like uh, I, I can put the YouTube uh, uh, in the description, you can see the video. Um, so there's a, a room first in the first there are two experiments the first one there's someone in a room uh, they're waiting for the experiment to start that's what they've been told but actually it's the experiment so there's smoke coming into the room mm-hmm. through a door of course what does the person do knock on the door open the door yeah they get up and yeah. knock on. so the second time in this setting it's the same situation except the waiting room is filled with other people but all those other people are in on the experiment yeah and the same thing happens but the other people have been instructed to not do anything they're just like reading or not looking at their phone mm-hmm. it's, it's a bit old and uh the person just stays there yeah crazy and the whole room fills with smoke and they stay there um so I think there's maybe not not more fitting image yeah. than what's going on yeah. right now. So that's that's my question. It's like we can explain all the reasons and all the forces and whatever, but the basic thing is like, don't we want to live? Yeah. But yeah, I'm just yeah. curious. Yeah. On, no, on I understand and ignore it. And then you have like some people who even in a room filled with smoke and with other people will get up mm-hmm. and will say, what is this smoke doing there? We need to do something. Yeah. And those are usually like the first climate, and also not me, but like the first climate activists who stand up and say something about it. You yeah. Know? Um, yeah, it's it's just hard, you know. It, it's even now, it's really hard. To, how do you communicate? The world is ending. Mm-hmm. I don't. I I don't know. I try my best, but you know. Yeah. I don't have the answer to this. How do you get people to move and to become angry and to go onto the streets? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, we're like also a learning movement. We just take from other movements their tactics, you know, and we learn from that. Yeah. But we're also not perfect. We try our best, but it's really hard. Yeah. So information is not... Uh, do you also give information? Yeah. Or, yeah. 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 yeah, okay. It was a little <laughs> yeah. I thought there would be smoke coming yeah, into... Yeah, <laughs> perfect timing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you give information... But why? So you could also go. You could also go into politics, right? Mm-hmm. And I you, might. Oh, okay. Do we have uh, <laughs> <laughs> what do you call it? Uh, primera. <laughs> yeah. Well, no. First, I need to finish studying, and then I'm going to see what I'm going to do. Okay. So, but there there are other ways that you could do. 
rather than willingly breaking laws or... Well, all the other ways haven't really worked, right? Scientists writing papers, people in politics saying stuff. It hasn't worked. So mm-hmm. the only thing that really helps now is breaking the law to make change. Yeah. I don't know. If you come up with something amazing, pff, go do it. But I, I don't know. Like, what else other than breaking the law works to get it across? So is that kind of out of desperation because nothing else works? Yeah, of course. You know, we, of course, it's nicer to just sign a petition and something changes and you don't have to glue yourself to a street yeah. or glue yourself to like a shell building. But that's, you know, that's what needs to be done. So you're breaking the law because you want to call attention to what yeah. scientific yeah. consensus is? Yeah, which is crazy. Like, why would we even need to do that? Yeah. But that's apparently what is needed. So then that's what we do. Yeah, I, it's it's also unfair to ask you these questions. Yeah, no, no, but no. But I'm just curious on yeah. your view because I'm a little bit older than you, and it's more I've been more like seeing it coming, you know. Yeah. But because uh, there were also conferences and everything, and mm-hmm. I saw well the the first Paris Agreement, I was really conscious of yeah. of that when it happened, and it was like this yeah. great it's going speeches, to change everything. Yeah, and great speeches and everything. And now 1.5 degrees is off the table at the new. Uh, accords in Sharm el Sheikh, so it's, it hasn't worked. It doesn't work. That's what we, you know, if something fails twenty-seven times, like totally fails, I think it's clear it doesn't work. Yeah. You know, and it's people who are really trying their best with all these conferences, and it's great that on such a high level there's discussion about climate, but just it it failed. Yeah. Last time at COP26, the president of the COP also like cried and said, "I'm sorry, you know, we failed. It didn't work, you know." But are you completely um, pessimistic in that? I mean, there are things happening. So we uh, there were some agreements at the COP. Uh, yeah, but you know, there are some things that the politicians in are say, doing. Eerst zien dan geloven. First we see, then <laughs> yeah. we believe. You know, also with Paris, it's all on the table. Our own government is not even meeting the Paris demands by f- not by far. So you know, you can make nice accords and sign stuff, but it like the re- you know. It, Again, if something fails 27 times, Mm -hmm. should we have faith in the 28th? I don't know. I don't have any faith in that way of changing stuff anymore. Yeah. So if it was up to you, what what would happen? Um, We need to, like, stop with new oil and gas investments immediately. So just stop oil, as they're doing in the UK. Move really quickly towards a society without... A dependency on oil and gas like really quickly we can use the oil and gas that we need now to really decarbonize our, decarbonize our society we need to end industrial farming right away because it's unbelievable that there's billions of animals being killed a day like whoa genocide on animals uh, that needs to stop and that's also a huge how, how is that affecting climate first of all like a cow eats this much a lot of food, soy, stuff like yeah. that. And there only comes out a little bit of calories, you know, one piece of meat. If all that food would go to people directly, we can feed the entire world easily right now. Yeah. So, and also those animals emit a lot of see, uh, like methane and stuff themselves. So we need to end for multiple reasons, the industrialized farming immediately. That's what we need to do. We need to make people aware of what's happening. So, for instance, like a climate press conference every week. What is the state? What is happening? What are we going to do now? Like during Corona. Yeah. You know, we need to go into total crisis mode. And during Corona, everything was possible. How come with like the biggest crisis on earth, not everything is possible? And then people say they have to like give up things. But like giving up things will mean... A bit a livable world. Yeah. We, you know, we need to stop driving. We need to move to public transport. Our investments need to be way better. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but it's not happening yet. I mean, some things are happening, but of course, totally not enough. Yeah. And do you believe in in your cause? Do you think? Do you believe that things are going to change, or are you just like doing what you can? Well, I believe we can stop the worst effects. Yeah. But some things, some tipping points have already been passed. And if you've tipped over a tipping point, there's no you way back. You can go back, yeah. So like ice, in, uh, ice in, the, uh, in the poles will be gone in summer. That's already a fact. That's going to happen. There's no reversing that. 
and that ice reflects the sun, which, you know, will not happen, which will warm up even more, yeah. which will make the sea levels rise. So some tipping points have already be go been gone over. But of course, there's like, we have so much to win if we would change right now. But yeah, it's not really happening yet. Mm -hmm. But we won't give up. But do you think it will, uh, do you think there will be a point where things start to change? Would they like a, a, another kind of tipping point? Uh, a tipping point for the positive? Yeah, it will have, you know, we're going to have to like live on the water. We're going to have to eat lots of different things. We're going to have to use way less energy. So things will change, but... But we have to do But like maybe, I don't know, like a few yeah. hundred thousand people will survive. But what about all the other billions, you know? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, things will change, but it's also who gets to be part of that change and who's left behind. A million people, millions of people a year are already being left behind because they're dying from the climate crisis. Yeah. There's two ways. Like if there's a, a crisis coming, like a, you, the building is on fire, you just have to run out and save what you can save and try to get the fire out. But do you also have a vision of, because many things have to change, right? In in ways that things that people are used to, like... Mm -hmm. You could almost say reality has to change because yeah. it's so such basic things. Even in in the Netherlands, we are now starting to experience threats to having water come out of the tap. Yeah, so we need to get ready for that. We need to live more with the light. You know, you're awake when it's light. You yeah. go to sleep when it's dark. We need to change the food we're going to have available. We need to also change when we have water and when we might not have water. We need to change where we're going to live. Millions of people are going to have to move in the Netherlands. That's already a fact. I mean. So yeah, we're gonna have to change a lot, but you know, people can you know we can also handle change. But are you are you busy with it? Are you busy with what would a uh, world look like when there's a point, you know, like in the smoke filled room when people find okay, maybe they wait too long, like with tobacco, they waited too long. There was a lot of scientific evidence, a lot of people died from lung cancer mm -hmm. for no reason, just because there was a delay. But at one point, okay, they said, Okay, yeah, we Let's we have to do something now, and of course, people and they will say like, you know, it was our plan all the <laughs> all along, and um, was it? You no, know how that goes, but, okay. but but there will be a point where something has to happen, right? Yeah. Are you only busy with making that point come quicker, or are you also busy with what comes after? Yeah, of course, because we need to. Yeah, that's also what XR does. We don't only want to make sure change happens, but we also need to envision the world afterwards. Yeah. So that's what we're also working on, you know, way more democratized world with less power on top, where we live more in harmony with nature, where we don't eat animals, stuff like that. So, yeah, at XR, we think about that a lot. And I think many philosophers do, too. But we also don't really, you know, it's also hard to say what is coming mm -hmm. because this is like an well, event that has knows. never been. Yeah. We've never experienced yeah. it. So we're going to have to go actually like back to the way our ancestors lived more. The way indigenous communities use nature, use the different seasons. Yeah. yeah. They're also like indigenous communities are also now being put back in charge to the forest they once had because they, you know, that's just a great way of like keeping forests healthy. So we need to go like back to a different way of living. Yeah. I wonder if they, I should speak with some, because... Uh, I remember when I was younger, there was nothing in the media except like milieu being uh, environmental friendly because yeah. you care about animals uh, or trees, which I do. But it's yeah. a different story, right? Yeah. And uh, many of the ways I learned about that was about uh, maybe uh, uh, North American or South American Indians yeah. already kind of warning about this. Yeah. So... I do wonder, like, because they've had a lot of time to think about this, what they would, would see. It would be really interesting to talk yeah. to. And also, like, all of our tactics are used for centuries by indigenous people all around yeah. the world, you know? And they do it with so much more power and so much more on the line, literally their lives on the line. Many climate activists around the world get killed every year by governments, you know? And they've been sabotaging oil pipelines and stuff like that for centuries, and we're here still sitting on the road only but yeah you know we're also learning from their tactics again yeah so yeah we need to go back to that wisdom and listen to what the people have to say who have not ruined the world but who have made it a better place yeah. if if it's okay with you i would like to discuss three more things yeah, yeah? Sure. okay 
So I'll, I'll just list them now because yeah. I forgot them otherwise. Yeah. So one is just some observations is that what I see from people who are busy with climate. I don't know. I wouldn't call myself a climate activist myself, but I'm kind of more like a journalist. Yeah. Is I see a lot of burnt out people. Yeah. Who are angry and frustrated all the time and are encountering a lot of resistance which is really unfair so that's one another one is i'm interested in how you see like the relationship between the law and because the law is there i think to mm -hmm. protect society yeah but does it protect <laughs> uh, but does it so that's yeah. another one and then the last point is like what yeah how can people support of course obviously if they can join extinction rebellion but if they don't want to do that for whatever reason, yeah. uh, are there other ways they yeah. can support? So, so the first point, yeah, burnt out activists. Yeah, yeah, it happens a lot because this is not just sort of your job. This is like your innermost, you know, what you're angry about, what needs to change, and it's also never enough. Like at one time, your job is finished, but your activism is, of course, never finished. Yeah. That's an ongoing thing that you know you feel is important. But in, in XR, we also really have like a regenerative culture. So after big action, people really need to take rest, get energy again. And then we go into the next action because we have nothing, you know, if we only have burnout activists. Do you have like psychologists involved? Yeah, in XR, yeah. yeah. So if you want, you can always talk to someone, which is really nice. There's also in Groningen City in the Netherlands now a master's in climate psychology, which is also really interesting. Yeah. Um, and y yeah, you can always talk to people and it's also really important that we build in rest moments. But of course, they're all like hardworking people who want to do something good. So then it happens that people work too hard. But in XR, we really try to take care of that and sometimes say you need a few months of rest mm -hmm. and then people, you know, come back afterwards. So that is about the first point. And then the second point. But just oh. about the first point, yeah. because you've become quite a uh, uh, like a public figure in the, in the past yeah. few weeks yeah you're active on twitter uh, i make a lot of you've been on talk shows I fight on twitter no just kidding i'm always nice on twitter so what ha what ha what has happened after you know like a talk show appearance what um, is that like i get lots of really good responses and then of course on twitter also some uh like right-wing people who don't believe in a democratic society and who don't believe in climate but i just try to ignore that for me i just sometimes delete the twitter app and i'm just with my friends or with my family and then i can sort of put it all away and realize there's like a real world outside of the online world um and i'm you know i think i also have like a thick skin so i'm happy to take on that role and i also don't mind to pick a fight with some people i really don't agree with because i know we are right that helps um, but yeah, I also need to take rest whenever I can, and I do, so I'm still fine. But why, if it's okay for you to talk yeah. about that, huh? I've been watching some of the reaction you've been getting. Yeah, I don't even read them. That's also a key. But you know a little bit what yeah, they are about. Someone yeah, someone took my private Instagram photos and shared them all over Twitter. Yeah. They were nice photos um, of my vacations, of which 90% are my bus or train, but oh well. Um, yeah, that was actually horrible because the story just sort of... I didn't have any grip on the story anymore. Yeah. Um, but... So just because I've been seeing that, so I think it's quite disgusting. Yeah, it's very sexist. That's the, th because, the main yeah, thing. So you're 25 now, but there must be someone who, who goes into your Instagram account, goes back... To when I was like 14. Yeah. Yeah. And then takes a snapshot yeah. of those uh, yeah. pictures. Yeah, it's horrible. And every time you, you post a tweet... There's different people who are posting yeah. the same. Yeah. So they're everywhere. Private, well, private, they're on Instagram, right? But yeah. the, this My is not. My account is closed. Yeah. yeah. Um, the which is and and the, they're mostly what you see. What I see is they're mostly men. Yes. <laughs> and some of them. So, for instance, there's one politician from the from Den Haag, where I'm from, from yeah. the council. Who who did that? Who's like in politics? Yeah, I, I I didn't even I didn't even read the reactions, but yeah, unbelievable. So how do you explain? Because this is this is so extreme, and so what they're saying basically what they're saying is that you are a hypocrite, yeah, because you you block 
uh, private airplanes. But I've been on a plane before. But you fly around the world. Yeah. That's well, what I have not flown around the world. I made two very long trips. And my dad lives in the US, mm -hmm. which I'm allowed to visit for myself once every two years. But I could go way more often, but I don't want to. And I made two far trips. And would I do that again now? Maybe not. But did I enjoy it? Yes. I was 18. Um, the thing is, it really doesn't work to look at individual consumption. Yeah. You know, and of course you can do stuff yourself. You know, not eat meat. I, had, I don't fly anymore. You stuff had like holidays that. In, with the train yeah, as well. Yeah, of course. Right? Yeah. yeah. So I hope I'm now the poster person of you can have amazing holidays by train. Because that's it's one thing. But the thing, thing is also, it's way cheaper to fly, you know. Last summer, my friends flew to Spain. I took the train. It took me 72 hours. And it cost me maybe double the price. But I, I know, think it's so important, so I work like... I know work. that, and I wish I didn't know that about you, because yeah. I read somewhere about a woman, I don't know, that how did you go to a holiday a yeah. few years ago, which is crazy already. But So it would be one thing if they would say, well, you're hypocritical because you, you, flew, you fly yeah. sometimes. But they're also repeating... So you've corrected this. You've, yeah. you've but it's also just a right-wing narrative... Yeah, so they're also lying about it because they know... That's also true, and yeah. it's just so sexist. I mean, all women in politics or in the public image have this. This would never happen to a man, so it's really horrible sexism. Do you think it's crazy that there's... Like, I know a friend of mine who sort of started in the public image, and then she had, like, one Twitter thing come up, and everybody was like... Rah, 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 rah. She was like, I'm done. Yeah. And she's, like, this amazing young woman who has all this power in her, and she's like, I'm just... It's not worth it for me. Um, so I just try to ignore everything, block everything. And I think I just have to accept that there's a specific group of men who hate me. But that's okay, because their houses are also going to be underwater. Their parents might also die in the next heat wave. And their children might have to fight for water. But I'm also going to keep on going for them, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is what it is. <laughs> yeah. Great. Keep going. Yeah, <laughs> I will. And there's, of course, way more positive comments. So, yeah. you know, I just, I don't even read the negative comments. Mm -hmm. I just leave it. But that's a, it's just another thing that people encounter so much resistance. Yeah, uh, but... But not just like activist because you, okay... But, but we're right. So it, that's why it doesn't really hit me, you know? I mean, yeah. I'm, I can't say I'm never going to be on a plane anymore, you know, if I want to visit my dad again. And the thing is... The the easier option should be the train, it should be public transport, but it's not. It's the way more expensive, way longer, yeah. worse way to travel. So, yeah. So, Extinction Rebellion, is that only like students? No, 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 no. no. There's like people who are like a nice uh, pensioned children's doctor. There's people in their 80s. There's people who are still in high school. There's people who work in government. There's scientists. There's the students. Yeah. There's everybody. It's like a really diverse group in age and in occupation so there's like s people working at scientific institutions yeah, who are we part have like of scientist rebellion especially yeah. for scientists yeah yeah and do they get a lot of pushback or um yeah i'm not in that because i'm not a scientist uh no i don't think so because you know science is also there to sort of warn the p and to show the people yeah, what okay. is going yeah. on and that hasn't happened yet so yeah. what they're doing is like r the morally right thing to do yeah okay so I, I want to speak more about this, but maybe in another... Yeah, maybe with another someone time. else who is the, a scientist. All right, that yeah. would be interesting. Um, so what was the second thing? The, about the law. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so what needs to happen is ecocide needs to become an international crime because then polluters can be prosecuted. It's now, it's not forbidden to destroy the earth. Yeah. It's not you, you're allowed to do that, so that needs to be a crime, and that will really help us. So you're in uh, because I don't know anything about this. So law protects. So uh, if someone robs me, uh, so individuals who are victims of a yeah. crime, but also who have rights and everything, yeah. you are protected. Yeah, but and nature is not protected. If institutions it's being are protected, like uh, organizations, the right to demonstrate. Yeah. Uh, all that. Uh, businesses uh, have have legal rights. Legal rights. Uh, freedom of speech, political parties and everything like that, but like a forest or something. Yeah. So that's also what needs to happen. Like forests need to become a legal entity mm -hmm. because then they can be protected because then if someone harms them, they can 
in like sort of start a court case. Yeah. So that's what needs to happen. And ecocide needs to be criminalized. So if Shell destructs nature, then that's a crime and they should be criminally prosecuted for that, the top of Shell. Yeah. And then people will get really scared because now there's like almost no fines, nothing is happening. If that becomes law, then that will really help. And we also need, on the protester side, we really need to protect protesters better. And that's what we have like amnesty for, but we have a horrible minister of uh, like law and she sort of really takes side of other groups in society not being climate protesters or kick out short to Pete. Yeah, and kick out short to Pete are because I'm Against explaining blackface. to our ex- <laughs> international yeah. listeners, yeah. kick out short to Pete are protesters who are against blackface yeah and that's a problem yes (laughs) that they're again not blackface but they're against it yeah that's treated as a problem yes so we really which is crazy but okay um so protesters really need to be protected better and also like we get arrested all the time and then we usually win in court but we shouldn't even have to go to court because we just have a right to demonstrate yeah so how does that work if you um let's move away from paintings but something you could do well i was thinking i was i had an idea for an action you can use oh. it if you want okay tell me so uh for me what i've seen what i'm seeing with the climate crisis with journalists and politicians and everything is like okay maybe something needs to change if we listen to the science but then many people are not are questioning that so mm-hmm. i think that's a little bit uh, in many ways it's like smoking in in the 60s or something Mm -hmm. so there was actually scientific evidence already for it for a long time but the laws didn't change yet because because of all the delay and there were also many people casting doubt on it and uh, so that's i think that's you can compare it right if people are saying well the story you told before that's not true (laughs) Uh, you're an alarmist you're uh hysterical everything like that also very gendered uh, yes things but well, we're actually just right yeah yeah but it's the same as someone's uh, questioning like uh, okay i would say the the earth is flat or something but yeah. it's the same as uh smoking is saying that yeah. was so i thought you know what if people started to smoke in public spaces good action i don't want to start smoking and um, the thing is, the tobacco industry is also horrible for the environment. Yeah, exactly. So I don't think that's going to happen. But it is the same idea. Yeah. You're committing a small crime to make a bigger point. But let's say it's what it would be mine. And I'm just between you and me. Yeah. I would use like a movie cigarette because I, yeah. I used to be a smoker. Yeah. I'm very happy I'm yeah. not anymore. Yeah. But you also need to think, is this the way to get the message across the best? But you are very right that we need better laws to protect yeah. the earth. But it's like... And I future would, children and I stuff would like have, that. I give presentations sometimes for my work or something in conferences. So what if uh, just during... Uh, now, obviously, I cannot do it anymore because I'm spoiling it. And no one <laughs> listens to me. <this. laughs> what if during one of the presentations, I would just kind of casually light a cigarette and just keep on talking and people do it. say... Um, so, but then I would, I would, they say, yeah, you're not allowed to smoke here. I'm breaking a law. Um, but then they would want to find me, but then I hire you. Yeah. Then you have to pay me a lot of money. No, just kidding. Um, you're on your own. So you, a demonstration is actually with two or more people. Um, but yeah, if that's part of your demonstration, you're allowed, like you're allowed to break laws. Some some different people. Yeah. You're allowed to break laws. To make, get your point across. Yeah. But you're saying I wouldn't have to pay the fine. No, that. probably not. No, if you're no. there just to make your point across. You can use, you know, mm-hmm. you're allowed to put fake blood on Shell's headquarter. If that's all part of your symbolic conduct, if that's part of your yeah. demonstration. It also means, on the other hand, that, you know, the views you use in your demonstration, they don't have to be what everybody agrees with. Like in Holland, it's even possible that like a Hitler salute falls under your right to demonstrate. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you don't have to agree with what happens in demonstrations. It can be like an opinion that that people really get angry about. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, if it falls under like the symbolic conduct and then you're allowed to do that and then you should be freed from any fines. So are you 
are you scheming like this? Like what could we do or what what action could I think about? Yeah, I usually don't come up with the actions. I just check if it's like legally okay. So someone comes up with the action. Yeah. And, they're asking and also if like a judge finds it doesn't fall under the right of them to demonstrate. Yeah. We can still, you know, say the climate crisis is so important. We have to keep on breaking the law. Yeah. Even if we have to pay a fine or something. Because what we find is, you know, it's so important. What will we need laws for if there's no land to live on? Yeah, and I saw another, um, I don't know if it was by you or someone else, but the, our, our government, the Dutch government, has been sued by Urgenda. Yeah, and lost three times. And lost. And they're still not. They're publicly it saying that they're not going to do what the judge told them to do. Yeah. So they are breaking the law. Yeah, I think they're going to be sued again. But that's the thing, you know. Even our own country doesn't uphold like the Paris Agreement. Even yeah. our, our country has to, you know, our government has to protect us. That's their duty, and it's just not happening. Yeah. 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 It just makes me very sad to think about someone your age that you grow up in a country where basically you get the message that your government is not for you. <laughs> yeah, no, they're here for big companies. And we've seen that time and time again, yeah. you know, they're not here for the people. Look at what has all gone wrong in our country. Yeah. The Toeslag affair where thousands of families were like committing fraud, even though they weren't committing fraud. Mm -hmm. You know, our government really doesn't work for us. Yeah. We, Our government subsidizes the fossil industry with $48 million dollars a day, a day. Mm -hmm. That's 17 and a half billion a year. Yeah. And there's children going to school without breakfast, you know? But That's happening right now. But they promised at the previous uh, Glasgow climate conference, they promised they would stop that. At yeah, the and they haven't. Year. No. And they won't, probably. So they're breaking their promise at the climate yeah. conference. Well, right our now. government has broken promises many, many times before, yeah. so I'm not even surprised. But oh well. That's what yeah. we're going to demonstrate again, the 26th. So once, okay, we have. To, I think we have to get to our last um, yeah. part, but I just want to say that from my perspective... You are on the side of science. Yes. And you are on the side of common sense. Yeah. But you are blocking roads and, you know, giving legal advice to people on how to break the law. Yeah. And I don't really know what to do. That's also one of the reasons yeah. why I wanted to talk uh, to you about it. I don't really know what to do about that. I do know that it's important to keep repeating Climate 101 yeah. as much as possible. And I think it's also important to have a vision of where we're going because you cannot, mm -hmm. like, you cannot live in a crisis twenty four seven for for decades without a vision. So actually, your question is, what can people do? What can we do? Yeah. So uh, of obviously, you can say you can look up Extinction Rebellion, see yeah. if it's something for you, right? But also, like, you absolutely don't have to get arrested. Some people can't, maybe because of like a high level job somewhere. Maybe some people can't because there are people of color or just maybe they can't because they're disabled or they don't feel safe. You know, there's many reasons why you don't get arrested, but there's also many other things you can do without getting arrested. Like if there's 600 people on the tarmac close to uh, at Schiphol, at the private jets, there's 200 people in the back office making sure everybody's safe, cooking food. So there's many roles you can fill within the climate movement where you don't have to get arrested at all. So that's the first thing. Um, and, you know, you just have to do whatever feels good. If you have like an hour a month to protest, that's amazing. If you want to do it a few hours a week, that's also great. There's many places in the climate movement where you can sort of do your thing. Yeah. Yeah. Did you hear about the, the Third Act movement? I think it's from the United States. Is that about people who are um, like finished with their job? Yeah. 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 We also have like lots of grandmas and grandpas who join yeah. climate movements for their grandchildren, yeah. which is also really nice. So there's, you know, there's place for everybody. You absolutely don't have to get arrested if that doesn't feel good. You know, you can cook food, you can uh, wait with tea outside of the police station if people get out of jail. Yeah. There's, you know, many other things to do within the climate movement. Yeah, and maybe just very simple, even if you don't want to be an activist, check out 
check out for yourself if what we say about the science is yeah. really what the science yeah. is. And also, like, many people think they're like, oh, I'm not an activist, I'm not an activist. Yeah. But my friends were always like, oh, we're not activists. But now they joined for their first action. So yeah. maybe there is an activist in some way within everybody. And the current situation also makes sure that we need to be activists, you know? We have to speak up, we have to speak out, and we have to do stuff in whatever way fits you best. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks so much for talking to me. I know you're really busy with everything, so I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Go to liveonplatoscave.com for other episodes and ways to support the show. 